All right. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for um, coming today. I'm going to talk about uh, new uh, therapeutics that might be coming for COVID-19. Uh, my name is Davey Smith. Um, here are my disclosures. Um, so we've had a lot of epidemics, um, at least during my uh, lifetime, um, HIV, CoV-1, swine flu, avian flu. Um, we had the HIV hepatitis outbreak, uh, hepatitis A outbreak here in San Diego and all across the US and the Nipah virus. So it was uh, not surprising to us as infectious disease specialists that uh, CoV-2 would be coming, but it seemed like it took everybody else unaware. So where exactly are we with uh, COVID-19? Um, here's the state of the epidemic from the 17th, which things are worse now, but over a million um, have died with over 400 uh, million global cases. So we need to do something about it. Here is the natural history for COVID-19. It starts off, somebody gets exposed, they get infected. Everybody starts off with no symptoms. Everybody um, then many people progress to mild symptoms. Uh, some of those will progress to moderate sym symptoms and some of those will have severe disease. But it's really important to understand the stages of COVID-19 when we start thinking about treatment because it's all about the virus early on. So the viral load goes up um, and then down before severe disease actually starts usually. So at the beginning, uh, antivirals is where we should uh, be considering um, treatment for COVID. So on the antiviral front, let's go look for an old drug. Maybe there's something we have on the shelf that we could use for COVID-19. So here are, is a slide that I'm gonna use over and over through this talk, but you have the virus that comes in with spike proteins, maybe, but keeping it blocked as a fusion inhibitor, maybe we can block the ACE2 receptor. That's the one that the virus uses to get in. There's also these um, endogenous, uh, proteases that we can uh, cleave off that the virus needs to get into the cell. We can also use passive immune, okay. immuniz immunization you too. and then immune modulators later on. Sorry. Um, so uh, once the virus gets in, there are various uh, things that we could perhaps knock out in the virus's life cycle. And the one that we'll talk about first is the endosomal acidification inhibitors. So. Uh, the endosome needs to be acidified for the virus to get out, and um, maybe we can fix that problem. So the best known one, I think, would be hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. Hydroxychloroquine specific could, does, uh, acidify, the, uh, blocks that acidification of uh, lysosomes, endosomes, and this would keep the virus from getting out. And it was really good uh, in data early on from uh, Wang et al. here on the left side, showing that uh, remdesivir uh, blocked a little bit of uh, CoV-2 entry, but uh, chloroquine, which is another form of hydroxychloroquine, did it across all stages of viral entry. Um, so that gave us good in vitro data. And then we looked in in vivo, and this was from the French group where they did hydroxychloroquine, hydroxychloroquine plus azithro and placebo, and they had some participants that were in the hospital and they uh, looked at them in those three groups. And in the dark line is the placebo and the y-axis is the number of PCR positive samples. So the people who got placebo continued to have PCR positivity. Hydroxychloroquine looked to drop that. Hydroxychloroquine plus azithro uh, looked to do even better. So it gave us more of a proof of principle that perhaps hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin um, worked in this endosomal fashion for CoV-2 uh, infection. Then there was a tweet um, from Donald Trump saying that hydroxychloroquine taken together have a chance to be one of the big game changers uh, in history. But of course, all those trials that were started at that time basically got stopped because um, they couldn't enroll because it was shown that there was multiple uh, times that hydroxychloroquine given in the very early, very later stages in the disease. So not so much in early COVID, but in late COVID when there really wasn't anything else to give um, was perhaps associated with uh, worse outcomes for participants. Um, and here, there's just a Kaplan-Meier curve showing that for early ca cases, perhaps hydroxychloroquine did uh, prevent uh, 
uh, death. So it had a survival benefit. That's what that green line shows versus uh, that red line. Um, but what happened with the president tweet and all of the hoopla that went around with it was that, um, you know, we didn't have anything given to for people who had later stage COVID. So people started just pulling hydroxychloroquine. It was used, has been used forever for lots of things. Um, so people just started using it and then uh, it was the tragedy of the commons and uh, caused and perhaps had a worse mortality effect and uh, kept us from studying it, us, me and others from studying it in early COVID. So, the lessons learned here is don't fall into the trap of something must be done. This is something, so this must be done. Instead, do the rigorous science and don't politicize the science. Okay, well, let's look at other things. So the next uh, thing that we had on the shelf that perhaps could be used are these RNA polymerase inhibitors. So blocking this part of the life cycle of uh, replication of uh, viruses, nucleic acid. And here's the remdesivir. Uh, study. So this is the New England Journal of Medicine showing that there was a shorter time to recovery in remdesivir group versus placebo group, 11 versus 15 days. And here is the graph uh, proportion recovered with the blue with the remdesivir and the brownish red and the placebo. Um, outcomes were similar for those with a duration of symptoms at a time of randomization. So it, it didn't, didn't look like it was that big effect early versus late, although these are all hospitalized uh, persons. So later stage COVID. Uh, but then, as we know, uh, the Sol Solidarity trial had repurposed antiviral drugs and they were looking at remdesivir, hydroxychloroquine, and lopinavir, and interferon beta. And their primary endpoint was in, in hospital mortality. Um, and then they were randomized in equal proportions between control and whichever other study drugs were available at those uh, local options. And uh, placebos were not used. It was just uh, compared to a standard of care non-treatment. Um, it was a big trial. Don't have to go through this too far, but just know that you know 2,000 people, over 2,000 in the active remdesivir, almost 1,000 hydroxychloroquine, 1,400 in lopinavir, 2,000 in the interferon group. And they were all basically have shown negative results. So mortality is on the y-axis. And here the control arm and the remdesivir arm are just uh, completely the same. Um, and then the other ones, you can see that perhaps even uh, like hydroxychloroquine in this late stage group uh, did worse in terms of mortality than the control. And the same thing for the interferon beta. So then there's another drug that was used for, uh, was being developed for MERS from a company called Ridgeback uh, that was then, which has been bought by Merck um, and is being tried now. And it's orally a bioavailable ribonucleoside analog. Um, it basically causes the virus to uh, mutate itself to death. Here's the percent inhibition for MERS CoV in, uh, in vitro and uh, the little nice, uh, top line is showing that it has a pretty good in inhibition for mers -CoV. Um It's a little bit less uh, for COVID-2 inferior cells, but um, since they're both coronaviruses and uh, susceptible in the same way, uh, it was a good idea to think about how uh, this lethal mutagenesis drug would work. And th those trials are uh, going on now. But those are repurposed drugs and there's more that I didn't put in today and we might see them coming along and I can update uh, as those come. Um, but what about a new drug? So as uh, Huey Lewis in the news, I think said once we need a new drug and maybe we can use uh, passive immunization which is basically a new drug in an old way. In fact, it's the first Nobel prize was given for diphtheria where diphtheria toxin was uh, inoculated in horses, horses uh, gave an immune response, that uh, antitoxin, that sera antitoxin can be used to treat uh, kids with diphtheria uh, pretty well. Um, although, you know, serum sickness, et cetera, could also happen, but um, it was very effective for kids with diphtheria. So could we do the same thing for COVID? And this is where we talk about convalescent plasma. So if someone up here at the top had had COVID, did fine with it, 
made some antibody responses, hopefully, or other immune responses. We take out their blood, we collect uh, their plasma, and we want it to have lots of antibody in it. And then someone who's very sick in the hospital there at the bottom, we can then uh, give them that plasma um, that would then treat their infection, hopefully. That's the idea. And there was a nice uh, JAMA uh, group of papers back in June showing that uh, perhaps there was a signal here. So here in the first A panel on the uh, y-axis is improvement rate and on the, the x-axis is time after randomization and that there was starting to have a divergence between convalescent plasma and control group. And then in severe disease, it looked like that perhaps that uh, those lines uh, parted ways even earlier uh, while, while in very life-threatening disease, they started to overlap. And that it really points that if it's an antibody treatment, early treatment is probably better than later treatment. And we'll talk a little bit about why that is in a second. Uh, the study was stopped early. It didn't reach its um, uh, predefined clinical endpoints and the study was underpowered. Um, just uh, real quickly, we've also seen some data now from Argentina studies and um, uh, Israeli study also showing no effect. Um, now, actually, Indian, India had a maybe the largest study that was just released uh, yesterday um, showing no real uh, survival benefit for convalescent plasma for inpatients. Um, so the jury is still out on that. Um, however, FDA on only third versions, just like they did for hydroxychloroquine, uh, that convalescent plasma was potentially promising for treatment for COVID-19. Um, but I just want to remind everybody again that don't fall into the trap that something must be done. This is something, so this must be done. Convalescent plasma. Here you can say that the something here is convalescent plasma. Instead, do the rigorous science. Don't politicize the science and try to get the answer as quickly as you can, but through a a good scientific way. We know uh, how to do good science. We just uh, need politics to stay out of it. So another uh, thing we can do with uh, antibodies is uh, we can be more targeted in uh, how we get them. And one is called monoclonal antibodies. And these are made by somebody who got the virus and they make a really good immune response. So we look for really potent neutralizing antibodies that they've made and we can pluck them out. So we pluck that one out, we purify it, we expand it in uh, vitro with some cells and we turn that those uh, antibodies into a treatment called a monoclonal antibody treatment. And we can then use that uh, antibody uh, treatment to treat somebody when they're infected or pro prophylax people uh, if they're exposed. And uh, these, this technology has been used for HIV and uh, for Ebola. Um, RSV, there's multiple uh, viral, antiviral uses for these monoclonal antibodies. And currently there are more than 25 companies that have made various monoclonal antibodies that are in various stages of clinical testing. And then there's also polyclonal antibodies um, and where they've taken this company called uh, SAB Biotherapeutics. Uh, has humanized the immune system of a cow, and then they expose that cow to lots of CoV-2 uh, antigens. Um, and this platform has also been used for MERS, by the way, with some success. So they vaccinate these cows. Um, the cow's human immune system makes human antibodies, but in a polyclonal way versus in a monoclonal way. And since cows make tons of plasma, they can um, get lots and lots and lots and lots of plasma from these cows to be able to turn it into a therapeutic. And those, those studies are in their early stages right now, but uh, probably will be coming to clinical trials in humans um, in phase two studies soon. Okay, let's go back to the natural history. So we had the first part where it's all about the virus and we want to use antivirals there. And the next stages in terms of mild, moderate, really moderate and severe disease is all about inflammation. So in this, in this infection, there are some people who have an immune system that gets triggered in a way that causes moderate and severe disease. And there is there a way to untrigger the immune system using immune modulators to um, prevent people from really getting sick. 
So this is the group there at the top, and it's all about the macrophages, the B cells, the T cells, the human immune response. And here's just a slide, I won't go through it, but uh, this is all the different agents and others that are coming. But the immune modulator list is quite large up there at the top, which also includes hydroxychloroquine, as we all know it has immune modulation uh, abilities from our rheumatoid arthritis use. Uh, but the first one we always talk about is steroids, and it's always a contentious group among, uh, maybe less so among ID docs, but more so among critical care docs. But here, also in a JAMA uh, issue showing that here on the left side is cumulative proportion of people who had organ-free support days. And the, the black line was no hydroxycortisone, and then there was different uh, doses, shock-dependent, fixed dose, et cetera. And there was a 93% probability of benefit for fixed dose hydroxycortisone, 80% probability for shock-dependent dosing. But the study was stopped early and did not meet pre-specified statistical triggers for trial um, for superiority. But it was very intriguing. And also in that issue, they looked at um, just all the steroid data, um, but they included mineral corticoids and uh, glucocorticoids with dexamethasone, hydroxycortisone, methylprednisolone. And on the right, uh, over there on the right, uh, the little boxes. Uh, so if it was on the left, uh, the study favored steroids. If it was on the right, it favored no steroids. And as you could see, all the boxes and um, diamonds were on the left side for the most part, even though they might have crossed that middle line. So it gives some confidence or evidence that uh, perhaps some uh, steroid use, however not um, more blunt rather than a surgical knife, uh, might be useful in severe COVID-19 disease. So then there's a study called ACT. Two from Desivir plus Barry Sidonib, which I'll call Barry from now on, and it had a thousand patients, and it was to assess the efficacy and safety of a four milligram dose of Barry, uh, which is a JAK1-2 inhibitor plus Remdesivir versus Remdesivir alone in hospitalized patients with the late stage COVID um, disease. And overall, uh, you can just see where I circled that the 28 day mortality percentage was better in the Barry plus remdesivir arm versus the placebo plus remdesivir arm, um, about 3% three, three difference. So it's likely to be coming out soon as a way to further uh, improve um, survival in the hospital with uh, late stage COVID disease. And then here's our POTUS cocktail. <laughs> So uh, President Trump got infected um, and uh, they gave him Regeneron monoclonal antibody in the cocktail at the high dose. They gave him Desivir, dexamethasone, zinc, vitamin D, famotidine, melatonin, and aspirin. And I just wanted to point one thing out about famotidine. It's based on a study, a few studies, but here's one that showed off to the right that the intubation-free survival um, in it, with people who were on famotidine, which is the top dash line, was higher than those people who were not uh, taking famotidine at the time. The numbers are, of course, relatively small, but the data are the data, and this was why it was included probably in the POTUS cocktail. But I want to do a reminder here that uh, don't fall under the trap. Something must be done, including everything in the kitchen sink, this is something, so this must be done. Instead, do the rigorous science, figure out which population and who is the best for what treatment and at what stage. And I think with this disease, we're learning more and more that um, stages actually really matter of when uh, and what to use. So early versus middle versus late COVID. So here we're back to that. Um, natural history. Um, so we have the inflammation and perhaps we use the immune modulators. And then the next thing I wanna say is that during inflammation for this disease in particular, um, although we've seen this with many infectious diseases before that as the inflammatory uh, process gets geared up, so does the hypercoagulable or, or the coagulation pathways also 
um, start cascading in different ways. And here, the, these patients become more, uh, they become hypercoagulable. So people are now looking at anticoagulants um, during this later stage. And here are the anticoagulant drug targets. You don't have to go through all these, but low molecular weight heparin will be coming out soon for various trials, as is uh, regular heparin, and then a variety of direct oral anticoagulants, so the DOAX. DOAX are going to be used um, quite a bit in uh, clinical trials to see if they can stop this complication in late stage. Uh, COVID. However, there are also some trials that are going to be looking at early COVID to see if uh, blocking various points of the ca coagulation cascade um, changes outcomes. Just a little bit on the HIV side, where this is high rounds. Um, and so there's been a few studies, albeit small. This first one is, was in JADES in September, and they had a match study of 21 people who had HIV plus COVID and with 42 who didn't have HIV, but they did have COVID. And the people who had both HIV and uh, COVID uh, had a trend toward increased rates of ICU admission, mechanical ventilation, and mortality, and a higher admission in peak CRP. So that gave some evidence. Here was a bigger study uh, done uh, in the Lancet that was published in August. And on the y-axis is the CD4 counts, the buckets of CD4 counts. And the green is HIV, people with HIV without COVID. Red is people with HIV with COVID. And then the blue was critically ill persons with uh, HIV and COVID-19. And basically the numbers are small on this graph, but on the blue bars, you can see that if someone had really low CD4 counts, there was four out of six people who had uh, severe critically ill COVID versus in this observational study, people who uh, had less than 200 T cells, people with HIV with less than 200 T cells had about the same rate of COVID between the two groups. Um, and then no one who had greater than 500 T cells fell into that uh, critically ill uh, group with, uh, who were co-infected. So in summary, those studies uh, remain small and short for the HIV people. So we, we, still, don't, we still have a lot more to learn. Um, but at the moment, we really think that people with HIV should receive the same treatment apl applied to the general population. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Mitra. This is a commercial, um, and, but I hopefully it's also enlightening about uh, how we're going to get to the best therapies as quickly as possible. And this is part of active Operation Warp Speed and specifically Active 2. There are four, there are five trials, sorry, with uh, Active, which stands for Accelerating COVID-19 Therapeutic Interventions and Vaccines. It was started on the April the 17th of this year as a public-private partnership to speed the development of the most promising treatments and vaccines. Active one is immune modulatory, active two are outpatient, so early COVID. Active three is inpatient, so later COVID. Active four is looking at the anticoagulants, and they're actually looking at the anticoagulants uh, both in early and late COVID and people who are post uh, COVID. Um, and then active five is looking at inpatients again, but very much on the combination of various agents. So here is our commercial. I'm not a COVID-19 patient. I'm a breakthrough waiting to happen. Uh, the press uh, has gotten big over the past two weeks and maybe you've seen some of this um, on your Facebook feeds or on your news scrolls. Or um, So if you see anything you like or you don't like, let me know because we're having these meetings every day of how to adjust um, this campaign. So the, the name for the trial is Adaptive Platform Treatment Trial for Outpatients with COVID-19, also known as Outpatient Monoclonal Antibodies and Other Therapies, or uh, Adapt Out COVID or Active 2. It actually was started with the AIDS Clinical Trial Group um, and still is uh, housed within the structure of the AIDS Clinical Trial Group. And we were awarded that because uh, they thought that we, and they know that we are one of the best um, clinical trials group in the world. So the objective of the study was to rapidly, is to rapidly and efficiently evaluate multiple potential therapeutics for COVID-19 in an outpatient setting. Uh, the trial designed is randomized, blinded, controlled platform that allows agents to be added and dropped during the study. 
It begins with a phase two, followed by a larger phase three for promising agents. And I'll talk about that in a second. When two or more agents are being tested at the same time, the same placebo will be used concurrently. Um, and that allows to increase efficiency over the whole trial. The agents that are be put into the trial are prioritized on their activity against the COVID-2 entry and replication, our phase one pharmacokinetic and safety data, and the potential to expand the phase three if found effective. So here's a master protocol. And what a master protocol means is that we're able to do lots of different agents um, on the same structure, the same platform of the trial. So here uh, we have an agent versus placebo and it's uh, randomized in a one-to-one -one, um, comparison. And it's always the agent is compared to placebo. And that placebo, as it changes over the trial, might actually become the standard of care. So if we find a good agent and uh, we think that it has become the standard of the care, a placebo is then replaced by that standard of care. But here you have an agent A, it comes in, we start off with 110 people who are participating with the active agent and 110 people who will then get randomized blinded to control. And we look and see if it shows promise, which I'll talk about in a second. And if it doesn't, we stop. But then agent B might come in, might come in even before agent A has stopped. Um, it also enrolls 110 people. It, we look to see if it shows promise. If it does, then we enroll a much larger 890 people to see if it actually works. And the master, this platform trial is designed to be registrational. So the FDA has given us guidelines of uh, what, uh, if we see what we want to see, then that agent will then get approved for treatment of COVID-19. And then at the same time, maybe or later, a phase, an agency might come in um, with the same thing. It enrolls 110 people with shared placebo, and uh, if it shows promise, uh, we keep going. And the objective here is to find better than better than better strategies to treat um, COVID-19. The primary object objectives in phase two is to look at uh, safety and efficacy of an agent to reduce the duration of COVID-19 symptoms, and also to look at the, if it can actually decrease the amount of shedding in somebody's nose after 28 days. So these are the phase two objectives. But we're really interested in to see whether or not an agent has some activity to be able to graduate. So if it graduates from phase two or phase three, if it doesn't meet some criteria, then we drop it and move on to something else. And the the phase two graduation is based on uh, NP swabs, and we're looking at the proportion negative between the control group and the agent group, or decrease in the copies, or reduction in the median area under the curve. We're also looking at symptoms, and this is a diary that the participants take every day. We're going to see if we improve uh, the symptoms 20, at least 20% between the active versus placebo group. And then we're also looking at pulse oxygenation and other considerations like safety. And then the rebound of virology or symptoms might tell us something about the drug. And even if it was able to, let's say, reduce the amount of virus early on, if the virus started to come back, we would be worried about resistance and perhaps that agent wouldn't graduate. In phase three, if it does graduate, then we're gonna be testing it to determine if an agent will prevent either hospitalization or death through 28 days after study entry. And this is, a uh, hard endpoint and a hard clinical endpoint um, that the FDA considers appropriate. If it's able to show this effect, then uh, they would consider it for approval. Um, so that's the design of the study. Uh, who's eligible? Well, it's adults um, who have active COVID-2 infection within seven days of prior of entry and at least one COVID-19 symptom for at least 28, I'm sorry, for 10 days prior to entry. So, people who've had a positive test within the previous week and their first symptom has started uh, within the previous seven days are eligible for the study. But if, they do, if their symptoms started even earlier than that, then they're not eligible because we're looking very much at early COVID. And then they just need to have a positive test um, within a week before they come in and that the symptoms are still occurring within uh, 48 hours of coming in. The study also has a stratification. We know that people who are at higher risk for COVID-19 progression are the ones we really want to try to keep out of the hospital and as well as possible. They're also the ones that are most likely to go into, um, to be what they call the long haulers, so to have symptoms for a long time. So half the people who enter the trial um, need to be at higher risk for COVID-19 progression, so greater than 55 years old or comorbidity like hyperblood 
hypertension or cardiovascular disease, diabetes, obesity, et cetera. We're also looking at whether or not time matters. So we have a stratification to try to get half the people enrolled within five days of their symptoms. The symptom diary for our severity score is the ones you can think of for COVID-19. So here's the symptoms that are uh, including here. We didn't include in our severity score loss of taste and um, smell. Those are important. Those are classic now for COVID-19 symptoms, but they don't change a lot uh, early on depending on progression. So we didn't think that it would be that is as important for our uh, treatment effect that we want to see. So we're focused on uh, these here, like fever, cough, shortness of breath. So here's the study visits. Uh, phase two starts off on day zero. The person gets the active drug or the placebo. We collect blood, saliva, we collect uh, pulse ox, we do an NP swab, we teach them how to do a study diary, which has the symptom score. We also teach them how to do their anterior nasal swab, and we have a setup for a daily reminder. And then they get uh, blood and saliva collected on days 3, 7, 14, 21, and 28. Um, and also at that time, we collect the MP swabs, the oxygenation. Uh, we also, uh, they do their study diary every day through 28. And with their daily reminders, we're collecting those data. And then we're doing, collecting their anterior nasal swab that they do at home every day through day 14. And then we follow up on later weeks 12 and 24 with blood collection. If during this high touch uh, phase two, it shows that it had, that the agent graduates, it goes to phase three, which is a much lighter touch um, uh, study. So on day zero, they basically get the same thing for blood and oxygen, pulse ox, and then MP swab study diary. And then they go home and they do their anterior nasal swabs and their study diary. Um, and then they don't come back until day 28 where we collect some blood and some pulse ox, et cetera. And then we also follow them at week 12 and 24 to see how they're doing. To increase efficiency, the participants who were in phase two, it's designed so they also can contribute to the phase three endpoint. Um, so uh, it increases the overall efficiency of the trial based on how, whether or not they were hospitalized or perhaps died, died during the study. Here again is our press campaign. You might have seen it. And if you have any suggestions, please let me know. Here's the uh, website. So riseabovecovidoneword.org. Um, please check us out. Please let us let me know if you think there's anything that should be changed. But here's all the sites that are in the US. We are activating about one to four sites a day across the US. Um, we have, I think, almost 50 sites activated and we've enrolled uh, 150 people, I think, uh, as of today um, across the US. So things are really gearing up. Um, but this is just a website that allows uh, partic potential participants to come and find us and ask more questions. Here's our study team. And then the other big thing that we're doing is we're chasing uh, the dragon globally, so to speak. So it's not just a US um, disease epidemic, it is a pandemic across the world. So Active2 is aggressively starting to, is aggressively standing up sites outside the United States, including India, South America, um, Mexico, um, South Africa. So Australia even, and perhaps the Philippines soon. So we're hoping that it'll be a worldwide effort to increase the efficiency and get these treatments out sooner to the world. Um, just uh, real quickly, the, the one agent that we're gonna start, that is started right now in the active two and UCSD as a site um, is the monoclonal antibody by Lilly. Um, it's not the one that was given to the president, but it is a, a very similar one. Um, and then the next agent to come across will be another monoclonal antibody from a different company, not Regeneron. And then another agent will be an inhaled uh, version of uh, interferon that should be coming into the trial after that. And then perhaps even another polyclonal antibody or another monoclonal antibody that will give, be given by uh, IM and Injection. So all these different 
agents will be coming through uh, the trial site. We're also in San Diego looking for other partners. Um, we're a big city and, and we have lots of cases here. Um, so the BA is gonna be working on being part of Active 2 as is Kaiser, as is um, perhaps Family Health Centers in San Diego. So we're very excited to have lots of partners across the city. I do think there's hope. I think that on the antibody side, convalescent plasmas, the jury is still out. I worry that the effect size is, if there is, if there is an effect, I think it's might be kind of small because we haven't been, we've been getting uh, mixed messages in the literature. Uh, the polyclonal animal seria, I don't know. It's just very interesting. It did seem to work quite well for MERS and perhaps that might be very useful. Monoclonal antibodies um, seem to be very active but uh, the clinical trial data honestly are relatively small. The companies have generated some data and then the active groups have also generated some data, but overall those um, data are kind of small and it'll be very interesting to see what the FDA does. Uh, Regeneron and Lilly both are now requesting an emergency use authorization based on their small amount of clinical data. It does seem that the bar to get an EUA is relatively small. Um, so that probably, that might change some things. Um, but as we've seen with hydroxychloroquine and I think probably with uh, convalescent plasma soon that EUAs will come and go. Um, but who knows, we'll have to see it. Along those lines, and I don't know the answer, but active three, which has the same Lily compound as active two, but active three is for inpatients, that trial was stopped by the D it was paused by the DSMB to look at more data. I have no idea um, why they paused it. Um, but I do know is that we in Active 2 share the exact same DSMB as Active 3. And that DSMB told us Active 2 to continue. So they, they had no concerns whatsoever with the continuing of the Lilly product in outpatients, but they wanted to look at the data more deeply in the in the Active 3 group. So I think that DSMB happens next week, so we'll know more then. And then there's a bunch of small molecules that are being tested, including Chemostat, which is a protease inhibitor for that endogenous protein, uh, EIDD, which is the one that is now owned by Merck. Um, there's other hep old hepatitis C drugs for polymerase inhibitors, which is like AT527 from the ITA pharmaceuticals, which might which is in um, use. Papiravir is also being used, Apilomod, which is a acidification compound, and endosomes is also being tried. Um, and we'll be seeing these soon out into the field. Antithrombotics, like we talked about, are coming to study near you. And then, of course, immune modulatory drugs are also being used. Um, and then the combinations are very much um, the next step, I think, especially for late COVID. So here are my parting thoughts. The good part is science works. We know how to do it. We should do it. We'll likely have a treatment soon that will help keep people with COVID-2 outside of the hospital. And I think that once we have that agent, it really would help with pandemic control. Um, we could imagine that um, from what we learned, like with HIV, that if we treat people early enough, that keeps uh, spread down and then might be very useful in that setting. It's also very, thought provoking or I think hopeful to think about that if people were to get sick, we would at least have a treatment for them. So you can think as things, as businesses open up, schools open up, that we'd want to have something that would keep people out of the hospital in case um, they were to get sick. The bad thing or the lessons learned, I think, is that here's politics is bad for the science and we really need to think about EUAs. We need to think about political pronouncements of what work or what don't work and then not to go too far beyond what the data say. Um, it it uh, causes distrust to the public, the science community, et cetera, and um, just makes everything messy. Um, but, and, but another thing that's bad is that I think we're unlikely to have an inexpensive, widely available treatment soon. If there was a drug that we had, were able to repurpose that treated early COVID uh, that was inexpensive um, and not made new just for this purpose, then it might've been less costly than what we're gonna have, I think, in, in the future. There are people who, um, collaborators and who have provided slides for me. And then I wanted to thank you for your time and attention. That's all I have, Jill.
<laughs> Thanks, Davey. It actually was a pretty quiet. There was one question about uh, your thoughts on aspirin. I realize it's not an anticoagulant, but as an antiplatelet agent, has there been any thoughts about the use around that? Yeah, so there are. Um, <laughs> I'm actually going to be talking, I'm actually going to be reviewing some data on aspirin and its antiviral effect coming up in the, over the next two weeks um, to see whether or not it would be useful for um, COVID-2. So I don't have a lot of insight and to know that lots of viruses have, uh, there's lots of in vitro data uh, showing that uh, aspirin has some uh, antiviral effects. And then in, in animal studies, it also has some immune modulatory, of course, cyclooxygenase uh, effects and whether or not that would be targeted towards um, what COVID-2 dysregulates is, is the big question. So I don't have the answer to that, but I do know uh, that people are looking at it. Thanks, that's very helpful. Oh. <clears throat> I don't know if you can see the chat now, but I will read for you. Um, Dan Lee asks, can you comment on blood type O and statin use? Yeah, I, I, I can comment on it, but I don't know if I, if, if, if it's the answer. I do know that uh, blood type, there is a strong, I think there, I, opinion, my opinion is that there's a strong connection between blood type and severity. Um, however, uh, blood type, uh, well, blood type has been shown to have lots of predilections for various infections and um, outcomes of those infections. But here it's whether or not, um, you know, there's something that is confounding or there, there's just a equilibrium um, connection um, between blood type and something else like uh, HLA, et cetera. Um, and then to the question of statins. So the, there are some <clears throat> evidence that uh, blood type O, or you could just think of it more broadly, that all the blood types might uh, predict a better or worse response to statin use and that statins, um, also modulate the immune system and that um, perhaps people uh, of certain blood types should or should not be on statins. And I, I don't wanna get too far ahead of those data, but uh, they're observational and intriguing. And I know that two groups have already started um, uh, planning their studies to look at specifically at that. So hopefully those data will be coming soon. But others might know more about that than me. Yeah, and I was going to encourage people to unmute themselves if they have questions or would like to make comments. I don't know if it's just one of those days. <laughs> yeah. I feel like it could be. It's <laughs> good. Um, yeah. Yeah. Dylan, Davey, so, uh, Marvin. Um, I just had a random question. So, you know, I, I think if I saw correctly, you know, the remdesivir didn't show too much of a signal for, at a certain point, right? But then... I guess I have a comment on, you know, the recent FDA approved emergency use of um, authorization for remdesivir. So I was just a little confused as to what they're looking at to approve that. Do we know? So I'm going to, I'm going to make an opinion. <laughs> I think we, we are, how about this? It is election season and here's another advertisement, go vote vote early. Um, and uh, everything is politicized at the moment. And right now, I think perhaps uh, people might be getting a little ahead of the data for the approvals. Um, but uh, there was the the gold standard, which was a blinded rend uh, randomized control trial showed that there was recovery uh, in the arm that got remdesivir. So that is the best data that we could ever have. Um, but it was smaller than the data from the Sol Solidarity trial, which didn't have a placebo. It was randomized, but and there was a control arm in terms of standard care um, that didn't show any data. I think, here's just opinion, is that we need to really focus on where, what is the best study population for remdesivir 
and uh, that will help us tease out when we use it and when we don't use it. And um, since it is an antiviral, I worry that uh, use it, thinking that it's going to be uh, the best agent for late COVID is, is probably a mistake and that we need to think about it very early in the state in the very early in the process versus later in the process. Can I comment, Davey? Yeah. So, you know, I think the the solidarity trial results have created a, I guess, a firestorm firestorm of confusion among a lot of people, Marvin. And I think uh, it may be beneficial just to hear the FDA and their approval of remdesivir did comment on the results of the solidarity trial. And I'll, I, there's a FAQ page on the FDA website for follow up to their approval of remdesivir for treatment. But I think Davy's comment is a very cogent one. The remdesivir trials, um, all of the ones that have been published thus far have been randomized placebo controlled blinded trials and the solidarity trial was not. And I think one fair thing to say is just because it's large numbers doesn't negate problems with study design. So it's, I don't know that the solidarity trial has major flaws, but it's not been peer reviewed and it's not been published. So I think it's fair to say that we need to wait and see what the peer review process and the publication process does with regard to the solidarity trial results. But those results are, as you've seen, and did not show major differences in survival among the various treatment arms when compared with standard of care. One of the problems in that trial is we don't really know what standard of care is in the countries and the hospitals and the populations in which those the trial was done. So there were uh, over 15 different countries involved and standard of care may be very different among many of them and we just don't really know what that is. So I'm not gonna comment any more on the solidarity trial except to maybe read to you guys what the FDA's comment was. And uh, the, um, well, and so their, their conclusion in their deliberation on whether or not to approve remdesivir um, reads as follows. While both the solidarity trial and the act one trial that Davey showed you contribute to our understanding of interventions to help treat COVID-19, the two clinical trials had different trial designs and different primary goals. The design of Act One was a randomized placebo-controlled double-blinded study that's better suited to rigorously assess a time to recovery endpoint compared to a trial with an open label design, such as the solidarity trial. Based on the findings of the Act One trial, benefit to patients was demonstrated, including a shorter time to recovery and better odds of clinical improvement. The solidarity results do not refute these findings of benefit to patients. I think one of the problems with the ACT-1 trial and its follow-on studies is that it was designed to look at that time to recovery endpoint, not a mortality benefit. And Therefore, the statistical power for looking at a mortality benefit isn't there. But the other problem with all of these trials is that we're looking at interventions administered to all comers. And as Davey has highlighted several times during his talk, the best time to treat with an antiviral may not be after somebody's on a ventilator and seriously moving down the trajectory of poor outcomes. So um, when you look actually at the data from the ACT-1 trial, and we don't know because the solidarity trial didn't collect those data, but um, when you look at the other remdesivir trials, what you clearly can start to tease out with all of them when they're looked at collectively, which is what the FDA, FDA did, is that people who were not on a ventilator, but seriously ill enough to be hospitalized 
actually did have a, a survival benefit with remdesivir in all of the studies. And so I think that helps to solidify Davy's point that antiviral drugs may work better when you treat early, which is the same concept that we've proved over and over again with HIV, that giving effective antiviral drugs earlier in the course of the disease before people develop serious complications or move down that trajectory of poor outcomes, people have much better outcomes. And so I think you'll see as the data start getting put together with all of these trials, particularly when we start to look at um, randomizing people by different subgroups as opposed to all comers, we may actually see differential benefit depending on when you initiate therapy in most of these trials. Perfect. Treat early and often. I think that's what we learned <laughs> in HIV, right? I think we're in the yeah, same borrow boat. Vote early and often. <laughs> yeah, treat early often, vote early often. It's all, you know. Yeah. All right. So that, that was a great talk, Davey. Thanks. Yeah, Davey, Anybody thank else? You I saw that there was a. Oh, thanks. go ahead. <laughs> cool. Have a good weekend. All right, everyone. Thank you so much. And, Davey, thank you. Great, comprehensive talk for all of us. Bye bye. All right. Have a good weekend.